You know what? Let's just get right into it with some voicemails. You left me a message. Now I'm playing it for the world. Let's hear some voicemails. Hi, Sarah. This is Marius. I saw recently a recording from Adam Sandler and Chris Foley of the Lunch Lady song. And oh, yeah, uh, you've been Chap playing Sui. this uh, Chinese takeout box uh, mm. character. And I wanted to know, uh, how did you end up being that character? Uh, did you choose it? Uh, somebody told you to do it? Um, yeah, what's the background <laughs> on this? I had no creative input in this. It was just like, you're going to be Chop Suey. Put this on. And I was thrilled to get to be part of it. Um, I had a, I was the lowest rung on the totem pole. Is there anything problematic about totem pole? It seems like there might be. I don't know. I'll look into it. But yeah, I was, I was the most powerless of uh, featured performers <laughs> there. You know, because I, I was only there one year. I was a kid. Um, this is how long ago I was on. It was Charlton Heston hosted. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like in the prime of his career, but he he hosted for some reason. And uh, so, of course, the the monologue was if I did anything on the show, I would it would be like asking questions from the audience. That's things like writers and feature performers would get to do. And um, and it was a Planet of the Apes, of course bit and because they needed to just you know the the art department needed to like get people done and I was so low rung there uh that at noon on Saturday I had to get in full Planet of the Apes prosthetics so they could just be done with it you know and then wait 11 and a half hours <laughs> with a, a face glued to my face. Now, already that seems like it might not be comfortable, but I had the worst cold. So my nose was just, it was just running like a faucet, just running. And I couldn't wipe my nose or blow my nose because there was a face glued to my face. And that made me cry. So under this face, I had just red stained stinging tears and snot that I couldn't wipe off. And I really, I, um, I remember I had this, it was freezing and I had this coat that I got from this place in New York called Andy's Cheapies. And it had this faux fake fur white rim. And I put it on with my monkey face, more monkey than usual. And just, went to sleep in the writer's room couch. I just, it was the only way I could deal with it. My body just had to shut down. And somewhere there's a Polaroid. And I, I actually, someone sent it to me. And I have it somewhere and I'll try to dig it up for, for YouTube. But um, yeah, no, I, I didn't say I, w I would like to be Chop Suey. Su I, I was just assigned it. <laughs> What's your day-to-day -day activity? That's the question. I wake up. All right. What I like to do is sleep as late as possible. But I do need two to three hours before whatever my first thing is. Because it takes me a long time to wake up and be coherent. So I wake up. I have a just a little taste of orange juice. Orange juice uh, is not supposed to be a big glass of orange juice. It's supposed to just be a little bit. It's a lot of flavor and sugar. I learned this in my older age. You don't need a lot. I have just like a shot of orange juice and I put this like globule, this like, uh, it's called lipospheric vitamin C. They come in little packets. They're not cheap, you know. It's a top shelf item, but I believe it's kept, kept me healthy this whole pandemic, not good. <laughs> because like it's just vitamin C, but it's delivered 
inside a like a fat molecule of some kind and it forces your body to absorb all of it. So I take a shot of that and then I, uh, I make a smoothie. Couple uh, scoops of some kind of vegan chocolatey yummy shit, protein powder, some water, a little oat milk, dash of cinnamon, sprinkle of flax seeds, blender up. Then I guzzle that. You never hear guzzle unless you're talking about like jizz. But I guzzle this protein drink and I take all my morning vitamins, you know, herbs and and, uh, supplements, of which I have a a bunch. You know, like a whole food kind of um, like mushroom immunity, whatever. I feel like it helps me, maybe. And uh, then I, um, some D, some B, some, uh, you know, shit like that. And then I also take a baby aspirin. Why would I take a baby aspirin? Well, hmm, I never expose this about myself, but it's like a makeshift thing. Here's the thing. If you're over 35 and you take birth control, it is very important that you not smoke cigarettes. Besides the fact that you shouldn't smoke cigarettes, obviously. There is a high risk after 35, of which I'm far beyond, if you take birth control, which I do, and the risk is blood clots. Well, what do people take to avoid blood clots? A baby aspirin. Now you're saying, Sarah, you don't smoke. Well, this is the thing I never told you. And really, people I'm close with who I've known for decades are like, you smoke? I don't, but I do. I have one cigarette with coffee in the morning. It's always how I've been. It's my joy. And as my doctor says, it's a calculated risk. He's like, I'm not going to tell you you should do it. There's no world I'm going to tell you you should smoke a cigarette. But in the scheme of the calculated risks we take in life, that seems like a semi-reasonable one. So, I mean, if I get cancer, I die of a blood clot, I'm going to be really mad at myself. But this is a calculated risk. I have such joy with my one cigarette and coffee in the morning. Uh, that that's what I'm doing. Judge me, don't judge me, whatever you need to do. Uh, Then I brush my teeth. Massive tooth and tongue brushing. Wash my face. Put on several oils because I have dry skin. Sometimes I look at this, uh, at the uh, YouTube of this uh, podcast, I go, oh my God, my face is so greasy. And it's not because my face is greasy, it's because I slather so much oil on my face because it's so dry. Ah, so there you go. Then I'll take a shower, a bath, or I'll just stay dirty. I'll be honest, did not shower today. I'm going to shower when I go home before uh, Rory comes over. That way I'll be fresh. And I end my night with a bath anyway, so I felt pretty clean today when I got up. And, uh, you know, then I go on with my day. I I can't imagine this is interesting, but this is, uh, I am answering your question. I do the things I have to do in the day. I come home, I'm thrilled to be home. I go, what's up apartment? What are we doing? I make some dinner or I order dinner. I watch, I do any homework I have. And then I watch TV. I left out uh, shitting, which I do not do. But if I did, would come after the cigarette and coffee, obviously. Here's some ads. Athena Club. You know, I got away with not shaving as frequently when I was holed up at home, but it's time to get friendly with my razor again because summertime means shaving more often. And thankfully, I have the Athena Club razor. This razor is the shit. I'm still using the first blade they sent me, and I, it's the cleanest shave I've ever had. It's so silky smooth. 
I'm committed. I'm a, br I'm a brand loyalist now. Athena Club's razor is designed with built-in skin guards to help prevent razor burn while being gentle on curves. It is no wonder their razor has thousands of five-star reviews. The razor blade is surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid, which is a holy grail of skincare. Oh, that makes sense. The razor kit is only $9 and it comes with two blade heads, a magnetic hook for shower storage, and your choice of handle color. I don't know why I got the coral handle. It's not usually my thing, but I love it. I also use the cloud shave foam, which leaves my skin so soft and trust me, a teeny tiny little bit goes a long way. Show your skin you care with the Athena Club Razor Kit. Sign up today and you will get 20% off your first order. Just go to athenaclub.com and use promo code SILVERMAN. That's A-T-H-E-N-A-C-L-U-B dot com with promo code SILVERMAN for 20% off. Obsessed with disappeared. Uh, do you love true crime podcasts, but also love podcasts that make you laugh? If so, let me tell you about Obsessed With, colon, Disappeared. Hosts Patrick Hines and Ellen Marsh are obsessed with stories about people who have vanished. And by the way, Ellen Marsh is going to be in the Bedwetter musical. Little fun fact. Um, but back to Obsessed. Each week, they tell one of these crazy stories by recapping an episode of their favorite show, IDs Disappeared. Patrick and Ellen have been best friends for 20 years, so the episodes are full of the kind of banter, wit, and loving jabs that only best friends can get away with, and they are so funny. Obsessed with Disappeared has over 5,000 five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts with listeners that's better than us. With listeners raving about everything from the top-notch true crime storytelling to the hilarious commentary. One reviewer called the podcast an audio antidepressant. Another remarked that it's her new weekly go-to podcast because the show is so funny and she can get her true crime fix, but without the nightmares. So if you are serious about true crime, but also love to laugh, check out Obsessed With Disappeared. It's Obsessed With colon disappeared it's like uh it's like hanging out with your new true crime best friends and we're back hi sarah what are your thoughts about splitting the united states into smaller countries like for instance red states can keep the middle and blue states can keep the coasts um i know that a big part of the argument is that we're stronger together but i feel like the differences that we've had between the red states and the blue states we have had since the Civil War, and it's not going away, and it's really not getting better. And we're like a feuding couple that is kind of only staying together for the sake of the kids. Yeah. But when do you get to the points where it's time for the divorce, where this is not good for the parents, this is not good for the kids, this is not good for any of us, that one side wants to go to the right and one side wants to go to the left, and therefore, we're stuck yeah, I get, in, I get it, in the I get middle, it. and we're all frustrated and exhausted about it. And at this point, I never thought I would get here where I'd say, how about we, how about we go our separate ways? Um, but I'm willing to entertain the notion. What about you? What do you think? Well, that's an interesting question. And I, you know, I never thought about it until this election and like, even when I went to bed election night and I knew it was election week and that the majority of people voted uh, by mail and, you know, it, nothing would be counted or decided right away. But I still went to sleep thinking Trump won. I just and I thought, well, maybe California can be a country. That makes sense to me. California can absolutely secede and, and exist on its own and have a great economy and uh be an ally to uh, Trumpetaria or whatever. I don't know how you can split up. Like, first of all, it's like just goes along with the elitism of, you know, the liberal of like, we'll take the coasts and you take the middle. I mean, the country is as divided as it's ever been, but the states themselves are pretty purple. I mean, you know, like, 
as a comedian, I've gone to every state. I've traveled to every state. And I've never been to Alaska, though. I heard it's cold. But then my therapist said there's no cold weather only. There's no bad weather, only bad clothes. But I digress. We can't just take the sides. Has there ever been a country that's like 3,000 miles apart with another country in the middle? Maybe. Is, has there? I don't know. But I think maybe California could secede. But, you know, there's so much of America I love. I love parts of every state. I love Birmingham. I love New Orleans. I love, uh, you know, I, I, I played Oklahoma. I had the best time. I You know, there's, you know, if I'm just being talking about liberals, you know, there's liberal enclaves everywhere you go. Texas has got so many awesome places. I love Texas. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that I think it is possible. You know, we never think about it because in our lifetime, we haven't really seen it. But we were talking about there's a guy that works here from Czech Republic. He's Czech. It was Czechoslovakia. And then that split up into Czech Republic and Slovakia. Right. No, Slovakia. Slovenia. Slovakia. Slovakia. Oh, Oh, shit, I was right and Raj was wrong. Anyway, yeah, we could. Maybe California becomes a country. I mean, I hope we can still, like, a uh, Euro pass, you know, go, go. I can spend time in New York and New England and other places. I don't know. I mean, but you're right. The divorce analogy is right on the money, you know? People get divorced all the time and maybe it feels like failure, but is being responsible for your own happiness failure? I say no. So maybe there should be like a Trumplandia and uh, California. I don't know. That's a really big country for Trump. I don't know the cartology, the cartography <laughs> you know Trump would have need to have his face on money so we wouldn't be able to have the same currency. Or he'd have like, just a picture of money on money, which is a little bit cool. If, like Escher drew it. All right, what else? Hi, Sarah. Big fan. I saw one of your shows at Largo where Largo. you were – the person of interest, but you didn't headline because you were working on material. I was just wondering of all the folks, all the comedians that you've had on to headline those shows, who is your favorite? Um, and then going back besides, I know you are a big fan of Joan Rivers, but is there anyone else uh, who mentored you or is a big inspiration for you as a comedian? Thanks. Yeah, pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic, I do like a monthly show at Largo. And um, Largo is the greatest, the greatest venue in L.A. And um, and I love it. I'm lucky to have a show there. But, you know, because it's my show, Sarah and Friends, I do it my way. To me, it's like it's like my birthday and it's my special day. I get to do it the way I want. So uh, I always go on second to last. Uh and I have a some a great headliner go on last because I'm always working on shit. And uh, so I feel guilty for the audience. I have like, a, I'll come on at the beginning. I tell them, I tell the audience exactly how it's going to go. Because when I'm in the audience for something, I, I hate not knowing how long it's going to be. I hate when it's like an hour in and I'm like, is it 10 more minutes? Is it 60 more minutes? I can't relax. So I just let them know. I go, this is going to be uh, 90 minutes tops. Comedy can't be go on and on forever. It can, and it does. But in my opinion, it's, it's no bueno. So I, I come out, I tell them exactly how it's going to go. It's going to be, the first comic's going to do uh, like 12 minutes. They'll bring on the next comic. They'll do like 12 minutes. They'll bring on me. I'll do everything I got right now. And then I'll bring on the last comedian who will close the show and make uh, everything worth it, worth every penny. And it's, and it's not just because I'm in process. It's also because 
I like to go second to last so that I can have a puff and enjoy watching my brilliant friend close the show from the wings. That's my joy. Also, when you go last, you know, sometimes if you, if you headline, you go last, you get off stage, all the comics are gone backstage. And for me, that's the fun part. I don't go to after parties and this and that, very rare. Not that there's after parties for uh, my show at Largo, but you know what I mean? Like for me, the fun is hanging out backstage and kibitzing. So I get the, that's how I get a, a little win-win situation. But my favorite headliners that have done my show, I mean, there are so many. There's the Tig Notaros and the Zach Galifianakis's and the Reggie Wattsies. And, uh, but I would say Todd Glass is one of my all-time favorite comics and my favorite uh, headliner when for the Sarah and Friends show because I just think he's brilliant and he's a loose cannon and you never know where it's going to go. And uh, he will do a thing that is my favorite thing, which is uh, he will um, he'll, he'll do his set and then I'll go, all right, the, the show's over. You are absolutely welcome to leave. I'm going to now, he'll just sing. He'll bring a band on and he'll sing and he improvises and he's making up lyrics and he says, listen, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to do this until everyone's gone. And there's always like, and so people start going like, right, this is going on forever. It's time to go. And he encourages it. But there's always a few people hanging on to the very end. And by then we're all just kind of hanging out on stage, joining in, laughing. It's just my favorite. He's so far out and he's, and you know, uh, several years ago now, at the end of a Sarah and Friends show, Todd was really unwell and you should hear this story, probably he says it on when he did Mark Maron, What the Fuck, which is the um, podcast he came out in. But he had a massive heart attack at the end of the show. The audience had left, and we were. it was Flanagan, the owner of Largo, Chelsea Peretti, Jeff Ross. We were all sitting around him, and he was just so sick, and we didn't know what was wrong. And then Jeff Mensch goes, this is ridiculous. I'm calling 911. The worst thing that happens is you're fine. And he was right. And Todd was like, no, don't. And then I was like, are you saying don't because of your insurance? Or He goes, yeah. You know, and then I go, Todd, don't be. He tells this story. <laughs> but I go, Todd, don't be ridiculous. I'll pay for it. And then I said, but it's going to be your birthday and Christmas. He likes that story. But uh, let's see. I have some funny stories from it, too. So he, he's having a massive heart attack. They rush him to the hospital. He's still in the closet, but I know. So I, Jeff is riding in the ambulance with him, and he doesn't know. You know so I have to, like, talk and go, uh, Todd, I'm calling your roommate. <laughs> you know, like. And, uh, and then he's in the emergency room. He's, he's being, you know, they rip his shirt open, and the nurses are putting the things on him. And. And Todd is still hilarious. Like he, he's, you know, noticed that he had shaved his chest, but it was growing back a little. And then he looks at the nurses and he's like, uh, I had to shave my chest for a roll. And then he goes, it was a Popeye's commercial. He's just like so funny. I mean, he's literally like in the middle of a life or death, you know. And then I was dating a guy named Alec at the time. <laughs> and they're rushing him to have emergency surgery. They put a stent in. This was years ago. He's like healthy as an ox and mo more like the most gorgeous he's ever been. But so they're, ru they're running with him in the gurney and I'm running behind and I hear him go, Sarah. And I go, Todd, I'm here. I'm here. And he goes, if anything happens to me, Alec is cheating on you. <laughs> he wasn't cheating on me, but um, it was so funny. There were so many funny things he said. Ugh. But anyway, it was very funny. And oh, a uh, mentor, comedian. I've had, I've learned so much from so many comedians. And as a young comedian, I hung out with a lot of older comedians and learned so much. Comics are the best. But I would say really, truly my biggest mentor, hands down, was Gary Shandling, who is my friend and my mentor and just the most generous comedian and person 
you could ask for as a young comedian, you know, and a, and a person just trying to figure out life. I learned so many key things from him comedically, like being comfortable in, in the quiet moments. And, uh, and, and, but also as a human, as a human being, he really like taught all of us comics um, everything he learned the hard way. He handed to us on a silver platter, and I'll be grateful to him always and miss him, just miss him horribly. And it was such, a, such glue. So many comedians, so many people are friends with each other because they have the common thread of Gary. They know each other through Gary, through basketball at Gary's or through friendship with Gary. Anyway, I miss him terribly. He was a great, great man and one of the greats in comedy. And you should watch um, Judd Apatow's two-part documentary that he did for HBO on Gary Shandling. Brilliant. He did so well by him. I know that Gary would have loved it. It's fascinating. And that's that. Here's some ads. Helix Sleep. Sure, politics, the pandemic, your love life, all of this stuff might keep you up at night. Sure. But if you have a crappy mattress, it's only going to make getting some sleep worse. You need Helix Sleep. I'm telling you, it's so good. Helix knows everybody's unique. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Even a Helix Plus mattress for plus size folks. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're going to get a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way that you sleep. I took the Helix quiz and I was matched with the Midnight Mattress because I wanted something that felt like medium firm and I sleep on my side, sometimes on my back and they sent me the perfect mattress. I love this mattress. Every time I lay down on it, I'm like, oh, oh, that's the noise I make. I love this mattress so much. This mattress is actually in my guest room and I go in there to sleep all the time. <laughs> Helix is awesome, but you don't need to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. And those magazines are no bullshit. They have a 10 year warranty and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. Why wouldn't you do that? They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Sarah. And we're back. Yeah. Why are so many conservative people so hooked on religion and, and you know, Jesus and God when, in fact... Jesus wouldn't be considered a conservative. He'd be considered more liberal. Matter of fact, he might even be considered socialist. Thank you. I agree. I mean, if you're going to give uh, Jesus a political party to join, it would be the socialist party, probably democratic socialists. For shizzle. For shizzle? Ugh. Gross middle-aged white woman. Um, it is really bizarre how many like evangelical right wing, uh, people Jesus would just hate. I mean, he doesn't hate. Not my Jesus, not the Jesus I know. Um, but it is like really bizarre the the, the amount of people that use his name as a shroud for hate. It's just like, boy, I think the word irony is is uh, built for that. People who just who just use Jesus as a uh, as a license to for bigotry is bizarre. They do not follow the tenets of Jesus. Welcome the stranger comes to mind when I think about the border here. People desperately trying to escape um, 
mortal danger and being punished for it by separating children from their parents. I just, I, it's, it's, it's nothing less than a crime against humanity, and certainly Jesus would never stop vomiting. Um, you know who I like are the... Um, I like Jesus. I've always been a fan of Jesus. I've been semi-obsessed with Jesus. I like the teachings of Jesus. Jews, I believe, they believe he was a real man. You know, but Jews believe he was a man, and, and um, Christians believe he was God or the Son of God or some shit like that. And it's funny because my sister Laura um, just got married to the greatest guy ever, Wesley whose sister's name is Blessly. I point to Raj, who's also Indian, because I'm racist. And um, his parents are super, super religious. And he was not looking forward to introducing them to his Jewish girlfriend. And then when he finally did, his dad, uh, he introduced his dad to Laura. And his the first thing his dad said was like, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And Laura was like, I mean, I think he's amazing. <laughs> but they love her now. And she loves them. And I'm finally going to meet them. And I can't wait. Because they created Wes. And he's my favorite. I really like the Jesuits. I'm not comfortable saying Jesuit because I always said Jesuit. But then Dave Ferguson who grew up in a Jesuit uh, school system, he says Jesuit. So now I'm, I'm teaching myself to say Jesuit. 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 I love the Jesuits. Uh, I don't know. I just, I have a few personal friends that are Jesuits. My friend Zip, Father Jeremy, Father Jeremy Zippel, who I love to pieces and who is my friend, who is now uh, stationed, do you call it stationed? In Belize. Um, I'm always threatening to send him uh, sheets with a decent thread count. But, um, and, and then there's Father Gregory Boyle, also a Jesuit, who I had on my, uh, on the Hulu show, um, I Love You America, and he's, incredible um he talked about his what he learned and what how he grew by being stationed stationed i don't know if i'm using this right in east la so many years ago and um he started along with a lot of ex-gang members and gang members that were to be ex-gang members a bakery called um homeboy industries and it's huge now and it does so much good. And he's so fucking rad. And he said something that I always quote really shitty. But I think about it all the time. And I think I can convey it at least uh, a little so you understand what it is. And then you can Google uh, Father Gregory Boyle in this quote. But it's something like this. If you don't make peace with your wounds you will be tempted to despise the wounded. And boy, I see that sometimes in myself. I see that in others all the time. I see it in politics a lot, in politicians. It's very interesting. It's basically what Jesus said. If you don't deal with your shit, your shit will deal with you. But it has like doth in it. Uh, if you don't bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. I think that's what it is or something like that. But it makes a lot of sense. Live an examined life. The unexamined life is not worth living. Socrates. Holy shit. Um, and then the uh, another Jesuit, Father James Martin. I don't know him, but I follow him on Twitter, and I think he's brilliant. These are this kind of Catholicism um, is based. They believe in science, so it's. It's a more intellectual kind of um, version of, of Catholicism, and I, I just, I'm into it. And then the Pope, Pope Francis, the coolest Pope so far, also a Jesuit. 
I don't know what my point is. I don't know what the question was. Right. You know, I just think like uh, to truly live by the tenets of Jesus, you got to be welcoming to all. You can't believe that certain people get to be treated shittier or have less opportunities. So, yeah, Jesus would have been a socialist, I think. I don't know. But, boy, the hypocrisy on the right that I see. Bananas. There's a lot of uh, religious people on the right that are very well-meaning people. Um, but that 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 those evangelicals who are pro-Israel is just the other, as my sister pointed out, Susie, the rabbi, is just the other side of the coin of, of uh, the torch-carrying Jews will not replace us. They just need Jews to go back to Israel before the end of days so they can go to heaven. They don't care about Jews. Stop it. Pro-Israel. Their pro-Israeliness is not a gesture of care. It is securing their place in heaven with their, their crazy religion. Hi, Sarah. This is now my seventh attempt at recording something. Oh. Because nothing feels good enough or worth it. Like Boy, this guy. Why would you bother or why would anyone bother wanting to put this on their show? I agree. But this lack of confidence and assertiveness and whatever is also why I'm a 38 year old virgin. So I don't know. There's not a question there, but um, I, I'm happy to see. I'm happy when I see you and stuff. So keep being in stuff. Yay. Okay. You dropped a real bomb there at the end. But I'm going to tell you what I've picked up on from your message. It's a lot of woe is me. A lot of woe is me. And you know what the common denominator is? Me. People think that this kind of... Uh, putting themselves down is modesty, but it's not. It's self-obsession. And it's, it doesn't feel good. It's not, you're not conceited. I'm not saying you're conceited. It's self-obsession. You cannot see beyond self, you know, maybe volunteer for something, uh, ask your parents or your friends, uh, questions about themselves find an interest in it. But this is an obsession with self and it's depressing. I can see why you sound so depressed. You've got to get outside of yourself. You know, I know you're a 38 year old virgin, but you know what? They made a movie about someone two years older than you who is a virgin and, and you're not alone. I guarantee you there are a whole bunch of 38-year-old virgins out there. You're not going to be a virgin forever, or maybe you will. But I think the beginning is to uh, try to get out of yourself. Try to get out of, of, of this blindness where you cannot see beyond self. That's what I'm picking up on. I, I'm talking out of my ass. It could be wrong. But um, there's a lot of woe is me down to like I called seven times and I wasn't on your show. Well, now you're on my show. And I hope this is helpful. There are men that get very angry that they're virgins and they blame women for it. They're called incels. And then they join hate groups. And I know that's not going to be you. I have, I have high hopes for you. I know it doesn't sound it, but I do. What we do with failure is who we are. And I think you can get past this. You only have to change your perspective on life 
one degree and the whole world looks different. Take a look at it. There's interesting stuff out there. I mean, this all came out of my ass and I don't know if what I said made sense, but I hope it did. Your currency is pity. I understand that. I've been in relationships where I only get love. I, I kind of learned that I got love if things weren't going well. And so I knew if I leaned into that, I would get more love. That's fucked up though. That's not the kind of love you want. It's not the attention you need. What else? Should we take another voicemail call? Let's Lisa, listen. My oh. name is Erica Holzer. I'm a lesbian Jew in Minneapolis, <laughs> Minnesota. Good um, to know. This is super cool that you're doing this. I just thought I'd tell you that um, I've been in some pretty intense trauma therapy for the last five years or so, and um, I can't sleep at night because of these nightmares. And so oh um, anyway, the only thing that helps me fall asleep is listening to your Netflix special. So <laughs> Every night for like the last five years, <laughs> that's that's what I do. I listen to your comedy, and um, it helps me fall asleep. Not because it's boring; I love it. it you're, I'm your biggest fan. It's because it's um, it's comforting, and um, it's the only thing I found that works. So thank you for that, uh, and just keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate it. Thanks. I'm gonna choose to take that as a compliment. I watch Law and Order every night to fall asleep, and it, it isn't because I think it's boring. It's just, it's just like what I know. It's familiar. All right. I mean, look, ideally comedy is uh, supposed to make you not fall asleep, maybe even go as far as to keep you awake, but I'll take it. I'm happy to help. <laughs> I have a way of making myself fall asleep. And I'm telling you this works. You come up with two random letters somehow. And then you think of people who have those initials. And by the time you get to like three or four, you're sleeping. That's it. Not that exciting, but I put on my eye mask that's got like socket, eye socket pockets, put it on tight. And that tells me my, my eyes, like my brain goes like, oh, time to shut down. And I get comfortable and then I just go like LP. And then it's like Linda Perry. Linda Perry, I just thought of that. She sang, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, hey, oh, hey, what's going on? That's funny. I actually, I loved that song when it came out. And I remember I went to Sounds, which was a record store, CD store, whatever, on St. Mark's in the village. And the guy who worked there, Brother Mike, wouldn't sell it to me because he said it wasn't cool and he wouldn't be responsible for selling it. I maintain he's wrong, it is cool, it's a great song. And I also argued with him that if it feels good in my ear holes, that's all that should matter. I had to go somewhere else to buy it. That was kind of what was great about the, the, uh, the village, I guess, at that time, which is now, I mean, I probably what like Brooklyn is now. Or not even. Who knows? Um, but New York turns over. That's what makes it New York. I learned that. I learned that in an embarrassing way. Where I was trying to impress this woman. And we are going for a walk. And I go, can you believe CBGB's is like a John Varvato store now? And she's like, who gives a fuck? That's New York. It turns over. And I was like. She was right. Lesbian Jew, thank you for identifying yourself. And uh, God, I wonder if she's single. I have a lesbian Jew best friend who I'm constantly trying to find a worthy love partner for. 
she is less inclined because she's busy and not thinking about it. But listen, if you are in your 40s and you are queer, she identifies as queer, whatever, and you don't drink, maybe you have a puff on occasion, but you don't have dependencies and you, you're not a drinker. And you have your shit together. You're in your 40s. You should have your shit together. You have your shit together. And you're single. Reach out. I want, I just want to find someone who's like worthy of her. Sorry, that was a lot of digression. A lot of digression there. And dad, we're rounding down. That is the show. Don't be jarred by me saying, hey, subscribe, rate, review, wherever you listen to podcasts, do that. That helps us. And check us out on YouTube if you want to watch it visually. All right, I'll say it with your eye holes. Hey. 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 Hey.